share this with you afterwards. Um, I will have everyone muted. If you have questions throughout, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm going to be looking through the chat as we go. Um, there will also be time at the end for a Q&A. Um, and I think that's about it. I will go ahead and introduce our two lovely speakers today. Um, we have Dr. Jennifer Reisman, who is our Director of Training at the Chesapeake Center. Um, she leads our postdoctoral fellowship program. Dr. Reisman received her PhD in clinical psychology from Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. After receiving her doctorate, Dr. Reisman completed a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric neuropsychology at Children's National Medical Center. And she is board certified in clinical neuropsychology and as a subspecialist in pediatric neuropsychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Very exciting. Dr. Reisman also co-authored a new textbook that will be released this fall, um, published through Oxford Press called Neurodevelopment in the Post-Pandemic World, um, which discusses the psychosocial disruption associated with COVID-19 pandemic and the altered developmental trajectory of a generation of youth. So thank you, Dr. Reisman, for being here today. Uh, we also have Carrie LaRosa, who is a child and family therapist and parent coach at the Chesapeake Center. Um, Carrie has been working with children and families for over 16 years, providing individual and family therapy, parent coaching, and parent trainings. She earned her bachelor's degree from Boston College and her master's in social work from Columbia University School of Social Work with a focus on clinical social work with children and families. Um, Carrie is also certified in parent-child interaction therapy and the Incredible Years Parent Program. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> and we do have some slides that we're going to go through that kind of hit on the topics. Um, but yeah, without further ado, we will get started. And welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here with us. Just a few accessibility notes. The captions should be turned on so you are definitely able to view the captions if you're on Zoom and you need to view the captions if you may not may be in a place where perhaps you need to mute yourself or something, feel free. That should be the tab right at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, but I'm just going to introduce us. So like I said, I'm Jen Reisman. I'm our director of training here. And I'd like to say that my superpower, and we know as parents, we all have our superpowers here. Um, I am definitely great at making teen eyes roll, especially those in my own household. And my teens would cringe if you, they heard me say that I have some riz, but we're just going to pretend that I have some riz for today. Hopefully we'll go on a journey talking about back to school and everyone will feel really good about this. Carrie, what about you? Yes. Uh, so obviously I'm a parent coach and family therapist, and I would like to say that at times my superpower is calming the chaos, but I think these days I would also um, have a superpower with my kids as being very cringy, especially when I say that word. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And Julianne. Yes. So I am the director of outreach and communications at Chesapeake. So I would also like to think my superpower is connecting families to the right resources at our center. Um, I am a new mom to a 10 month old, so I have not started the school journey yet, but I am taking notes. <laughs> Fantastic. Really excited. And so just as reminders, also, you can feel free to drop things in the chat. Julianne will be managing that for us if there's questions that come up. Carrie and I, when we present, we really like to be interactive, but we are so excited. This is a topic near and dear to our hearts. And when Julianne talked with us about possibly doing this presentation, we were so excited because back to school time is something that we really, really are passionate about and it's such an opportunity for us to get our children off to a really good start. But I'll let Carrie talk a little bit more about effective routines before I probably jump on in. All right. Sounds good. So this tends to be a number one concern. And some of the keys to creating effective routines are really being realistic. Um, what is your child ready for? And we're gonna talk a little bit about age appropriate expectations in a little bit, um, but also what are you ready to follow through on, right? So we can create this Pinterest worthy schedule and routine that looks beautiful that we can post on Instagram. And if we don't have the right strategies and supports for our child, if we don't, um, aren't willing to follow through and really stay on top of it to support them to develop this habit, it's just going to be a little picture on the wall that nobody's going to pay attention to. <laughs> so keep it short and sweet. 
these are a few examples. This is generally for younger kids, but I wanted to just throw in a few examples that, you know, just to give you an idea of some things you can do. So having it very simple, um, you know, including images, um, build on what's working already. And you may think, well, they always remember to do something, put it in there so they feel good about it. Uh, involve your child, let them pick the pictures, let them, you know, look at the order they want to do it in, um, you know, have them be part of the process that will increase the chances that they'll actually pay attention and follow it. Some of them actually get really excited about doing it. These were actually just in Canva, but you can also print a ton off online. I found a few things on Amazon that you can easily sort of um, customize, but you don't have to do a lot of work to, to make them happen. Um, if they can be engaging, if they're magnets or a checklist or something that they can kind of physically engage with the um, list, that, that will help them kind of stay on track too and stay focused. Um, encourage them and remind them like that's part of the process. It may seem like, oh, they should just know the ADHD brain struggles with routine at times. And so being able to really encourage them, be positive about it and remind them to take a look at their, um, routine chart, you know, where are you? How many have you gotten done? You know, great. Good job. You've got two left to go. Um, Try to switch it up a little bit, move the location of the routine chart, um, change the background, change the images, because again, even when we start walking by something every day, we may not pay attention. So switch it up, reevaluate it at times, see if their interests change and they wanna change it up. Um, and then reevaluate it if it's not working, have a little family meeting to talk about what's going well and what needs to be adjusted to make it a little bit easier. And it could be the order of things. It could be that they're going from one floor to the next and back and forth, and that's too many steps and too many distractions. It could be that they have they needed a couple other skills or a verbal or audio reminder. Um, but don't make it too complicated. This is a hard one. Try not to rush too much in the morning. And I question about this, Carrie, because I'm yes. your thoughts. What do you think about these smart devices helping for morning routines? Is that something you're a fan yes. of? Or do you feel like it really depends? What's your thoughts on that? Totally depends. I think visual timers can be great. I think whatever works for your child and sometimes it's, it's experimenting with it. One major downside with a device, obviously, is that it can create a distraction. Um, and so as long as it's used really to keep kids on track and they're paying attention to it, then that might work. Um, does that make sense? What's, what are your thoughts on that, Jen? I'm curious. I think it's also, it gets back to what you said at the beginning of the whatever works, right? So yeah. that if it works for you and your family and that that's part of what you do on a normal day-to-day -day basis, then use that. If that's not intuitive to your family or not something that's a part of your routine, that probably isn't going to work for you. But if that incentivizes it for your child, I have a family that I've worked with who um, used a Google device and they actually found that that was like, you know, through the Google home uh, things that they had, that they found that that was incredibly helpful and supportive um, for just making sure, like you said, what will you follow through on? Because it was a safety net for the parents who were able to say, you know, if I get Get, have something come up in my morning where I can't necessarily help out as much as I would like to, how can I make sure that I'm able to, you know, have a backup and having that, you know, device automatically remind that, you know, by 740, you should have your teeth brushed or by 750, we need to be getting in the car and getting our shoes, or, you know, get our shoes on and get in the car or, you know, get out to the bus stop. Those are the types of things. And that that can be like a nice safety net because right, we all have days when we oversleep as the parents as well. And so if we have a device that's backing us up a little bit, it can be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And then it, it, if it works for your child, then they can become more independent around it. And that becomes a tool and a strategy that they can use, you know, without you for other things that they want to remember. I'm glad you brought up the time because sometimes a timestamp also really helps. Sometimes it causes more stress for some kids. Um, but again, if it works for you to have a timestamp, sometimes it helps a parent stay on track. Okay. Let's back into this time. You have to be at the bus stop at this time. So that means shoes on at this time. 
Um, and, you know, really figuring out what works for your family. And if it doesn't work the first day or two, keep trying, tweak things a little bit and, and just kind of stay on top of it. I have uh, a great question in the chat. Um, should parents reward kiddos for completing all the items on the routine chart by themselves? Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> I'm going to say two thumbs up to that. And this is where you can have dueling expertise here if you'd like. I would say two thumbs up for that, right? That sometimes, especially external incentives or rewards are great. One of our colleagues here is the really lovely about talking about the behavioral incentives and reinforcement programs that we set up and that it's really important the timing of when we do reinforcement of things that we can't put that reinforcement before the task has actually happened. So mm -hmm. is that what your thoughts are as well, Carrie? Yes, absolutely. I think sometimes rewards, if, if a child, there's some children that if they're earning a reward for something, it'll cause them more stress and anxiety. Others, not so much. I, absolutely. If your child finishes that routine, you can provide a, a reward for sure. That could be verbal praise. That could be extra time with you. That could be choosing, you know, what dessert they're going to have that night for dinner. Although I would stay away from too many food rewards, but if they have dessert anyway, okay, which one do you want? Um, and then also the most effective rewards are when they are spontaneous, right? So um, if they're having a hard time motivating to get through the task list, well, one, I would I would go back and look at how involved are they? You know, if they're not invested in that routine at all, then you may want to have that conversation and try to get them a little bit more on board. Um, but you also then may want to offer that reward ahead of time. If you do this, then this will happen. And absolutely, you have to do it afterwards. Otherwise, it's really a bribe, right? And there's no guarantee that they're going to do it. Um, but if, you know, whether it's routines or something else, if your child is doing something well and maybe it was unexpected, you know, a spontaneous reward, verbal praise, kids in general um, don't get a lot of praise and kids with ADHD get even less. And so amping up that verbal praise and being specific about it is so key to their um, to reinforcing their behavior, but also to how they feel, you know, with their confidence and their esteem and being able to do these things on their own. So, sorry, go ahead, Jen. That was a great question in terms of the reinforcement for this, because even though we as the adults might think like getting to school on time or early is its own reward for many of our children, it's not. And so if we need to create some external, you know, incentives or reinforcement for that, that's fantastic and would definitely encourage to work that in and get in buy-in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I would actually say too, that often we sit down and ask a child, like, do they care if they're late? I'm shocked at how many kids do either you know, for school, because it's either embarrassing. They don't want to walk in late. They miss something sometime with their friends in the morning. So just asking that simple question helps increase the buy-in and they'll be more invested in creating that routine to get out the door on time. So I don't want to like harp too long on this topic, but because I'm so happy that Carrie and I can have this discussion with all of you, I know that from a parent perspective, one of the things that runs through my head as I have these conversations with families in the office is that sometimes this is easier if as a parent yourself, you are more routine-based yourself. If you are the type of parent that finds yourself, maybe, you know, you have ADHD yourself, or you just do not have great morning routines yourself, that this actually can be a little bit harder to implement or seem more daunting. And mm -hmm. so I mean, if, um, you know, I think that it's also important to recognize who we are as parents and what we bring to the table, that when we, if, you know, if our skin crawls, when we talk about a morning routine and things like that, that that's something that our kids are probably going to pick up on. Um, and that it's okay to recognize that some of these things may be more challenging for us and that our kids are different from us. Some, sometimes, you know, apples and trees fall very closely together. Other times are, you know, when, especially if you're parenting a child that has some very different strengths and weaknesses than you do as a parent, they may love and nail that morning routine, even though your reaction may be to it like, oh, that does not sound fun to me at all. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because it can feel stressful. I'm just realizing too, that just even having these pictures on here might feel stressful. It does not have to be a chart. 
you yeah. find whatever system works for you. I know some families have like almost like a little um, scavenger hunt type thing, or the kids do fairly well. And right before people leave the um, house, they have a little checklist, like, do I have this, this, and this? And then they go off, you know? And so, you know, it's really about also finding what works for you. Should I move us on to our next topic after routines? Because routines are important, but we have more stuff that we need to talk about as well. And I know for many of the families on this call, um, we may be dealing with children who have ADHD or who have other types of neurodivergence or other things going on where there may be an IEP or a 504 or some type of learning plan in place at the school. Or maybe you're not at that point and you're wondering if that's something that should be going on. So I'm going to try to address a couple of different things. Um, but I think that when we have collaboration with a school team, whether it's an IEP team or a 504 plan team, the beginning of the year is a great time to expectation set. Now, depending on your school system, we know that different systems just have their own cultures and traditions and way of dealing with things, as well as federal regulations that they need to follow. So many school systems are required to meet and have a meeting at a yearly basis. That's not always at the beginning of the year. And there's pros and cons, right? And having an end of the year meeting does allow you to plan for the next academic year, to reset goals, reflect on progress, and do all of those things. But one big reminder I always like to have with families in the office is to remember that as a parent, as a member of an IEP or a 504 plan team, you can call a meeting at any time and put that request in writing to your school counselor or whoever is the chair of that IEP team or the leader of the 504 team, or even if you're in a private school setting where there's some more informal learning plan support, it is okay to call a team meeting at any point in time. And that fall can be a great time to really expectations set, especially if you may be moving into having a new team. I know that many of our school systems really try their hardest to make sure when children transition from one school to the next, but often families are not in that situation of being able to take advantage of that, whether you're a military family that may have recently relocated to the area or whether you're a family that's just moved you may be in a slightly different position. And so to know it is okay to call a meeting if you need one. Um, and I also think about things like having a one page introduction. If you've ever read through or been intimidated by IEP plan documents or 504 plan documents, one of the things that's heartbreaking is that they're intimidating, right? There's a lot of boilerplate language on them. There may be some things that just don't apply to your child. Say if you have a younger child and all of the talk about you know, graduation requirements, you're just not there yet. But those are all included in that chunky IEP team document. So some things may not apply. It is okay in some families that I've talked with that really have you know, developed some ways of really empowering their children and empowering their team is to make sure to give their child's teacher a brief one page introduction. It doesn't even have to be a full page, but there's a couple of things that I really like to include in that. Usually is also a picture of your child because if, if you're anything like many teachers, they're learning a lot of new names and faces. And so having a picture of your child and just a brief description of what's going on with your child and their child in your child's needs that may be included in that IEP or 504 plan. What are the some of the most important things for you as a parent? Because we know that our teachers and our school systems have so much paperwork, so much things going on. And the more we can try to boil down for them, what are the most important things, especially at the beginning of the year, can help us avoid some headache or heartache later when we say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this teacher didn't know that my child is allowed to access this accommodation. And maybe your child is at that age where they're not, you know, they're on that border of being really good self-advocates. Maybe that's a skill that they're working on, but they're not quite able to self-advocate for that. And so you're relying on the teacher knowing about what's in that IEP or 504. And if they don't know kind of what's the most important thing for your class, I think it's really important that we, you know, kind of as the adults in the room, do all that we can to make sure to make it really easy for folks to access that information. And I say that particularly for many of our families where you are working with your child every day, you know your child's needs, you are truly the expert on your child, but people who are new to your child, they may not know. And that unfortunately our children don't really walk around with like, you know, big bright neon labels on their forehead that say I have ADHD, even though sometimes as a parent, you might be like, it feels like they do because all of the teachers have picked up on this or, you know, they, you know, may not pick up and know that your child has a learning disability or some other type of challenge. 
Another thing that's important when I think about all of the families that we work with, where, you know, their children may be dealing with things, you know, resulting from very early childhood injuries or trauma or things like that, is to include in that one page introduction, maybe a little bit about that, right? So if you had a child that was born extremely premature and was in the NICU and has, you know, been managing a couple of different things going on, it's really important that you could include that because those are things that don't flash in neon lights and don't exactly advertise themselves well, but that when people know that about your child, it can be really helpful information. The other thing I think about, oh, Carrie, did you have other thoughts? I was just going to add that even if there was this label that said ADHD on it, or even if they read the paper, they may think, okay, ADHD and make some assumptions. Well, everybody yeah. in this webinar knows that it can manifest differently for everybody and everybody's symptoms might be different. And so um, the there also are very cookie cutter um, interventions often, um, with IEP. So they may just say, okay, ADHD means they're, you know, going to be disruptive and need a lot of redirection and therefore I need to do preferential seating and extra time and that's it. So I love this idea of the introduction letter where you break it down, you provide some additional information that's not going to be in the IEP that might help the teacher connect with your child. And then, you know, highlight the um, interventions that you and your child actually think will work. <laughs> yes, I think that is so key. Um, and it's also an opportunity because we know kids change really rapidly. That's another point that I just want to highlight is that you may have a fantastic IEP that was written when your child was in fourth grade, but if they're now in seventh grade, chances are your child has changed a lot, right? their interests have changed, what motivates them change, the types of supports that they need, and that it is really good, I think, as a parent to be really mindful of the types of changes you've seen over time. And this is where, you know, good communication is important. I have the visual up here of herding cats because I think that any parent who's ever sat through an IEP or a 504 plan team meeting has probably felt like they are indeed herding cats, that everybody has different roles, different responsibilities, and that you're trying to get everybody on the same page and, you know, team your child. And that's truly what a good and well-functioning IEP team should look like and feel like. But if you're new to that process, or if you're transitioning schools, sometimes it can feel like herding cats. And so I want to let you know, one, that is okay. Two, there's lots of people that can help you with herding those cats, even though they don't really want to be herded. And that three, we can get them on the same page for your child. And it really feels good when you can get everybody on your child's team. Um, really to unite around a common goal. And I'll say that, you know, is like my, my social psychology tips for success for families that are navigating with an IEP or 504 team meeting, no matter what your experience was in the past, new school years are indeed an opportunity for fresh starts, for reset. So if you found that there was something, maybe it was a really uncomfortable experience. Maybe it was disagreement about goals for your child or supports needed, the new school year is indeed a new time to kind of refresh. You've probably got new team members involved with your child. And this is a time when we think about what motivates people. And one of the things that really motivates people is having a shared goal. And so I think that sometimes either using that one page introduction and saying, you know, let me introduce you, my child, Caleb. Caleb really wants to become a veterinarian. Won't you help us on that journey? And here's what's really important because people get excited about that when they can have a shared goal, feel like we're all contributing to shared success, but they won't know some of those shared goals unless you have them. And that most of the time IEP goals can be kind of cut and dry, but the more we can connect them to the real life interests of our child, the more powerful, the more individualized they will be to help them get back there. And the other thing I want to emphasize about collaborating with our schools is that they are not psychic. Right. And that sharing information is truly important. And that I think sometimes, you know, as a family, if you're working with an IEP or a 504 team, plan team or a learning support team, you may not realize how much you have in terms of knowledge as a parent. You are truly a key member of that team and that there may be things that they just don't know and they are not psychic. So sharing information and figuring out maybe is there some information that they just don't have about your child that's really key or helpful for them to know about that can help make the day go a little bit easier. But I this is a good if you time. know 
even if you know, you know, something specific that really works with your child, I find that most teachers who are open to that feedback will say, okay, this is really helpful because they have a specific thing that they can do for your child. For example, like if you have papers to pass out or have an errand to run to the office, great thing for kids with ADHD to be able to do. They get to move, they get to feel good about themselves, responsible, helping out. Um, and that's a simple thing for a teacher to do if they just know. I also would encourage you, if you find that a teacher is making an impact on your child or they feel good in their classroom, make a point to send a quick one or two line email to the teacher to say, I just want to say really appreciate how you interact with my son. They said that this, this and this, you know, is great and they love this part of your classroom just to give that feedback because who doesn't want that, right? And it also goes a long way with the teacher feeling, okay, the parents are paying attention. They're not just going to come with me, come to me with complaints, right? That they're noticing the things that are going well. And also talk about positive reinforcement. It encourages that teacher to continue those things that are helping your child feel good in that classroom. I would piggyback on that and say, I would also, as that parent member of the IEP team or 504 team, that is probably the teacher that you want to make sure is invited to your child's meetings, right? Yes. Oftentimes we know at those meetings, there's a lot of people there and it can feel kind of overwhelming, but you also want to have the key players that not just their schedule is available to, so that they can come scheduling is challenging, but that it's people that really have insight into this is how your child ticks in a classroom environment. And this is how we can help them better. And so if you are finding that there are certain teachers where your child is coming home and raving about how cool this class was and how much they aren't struggling in this particular classroom setting, maybe that teacher is going to have some great insight into how to set up learning environments that will be really helpful in crafting that next stage of an IEP or 504 plan team. Um, but I think that that's all really, really good, helpful advice to be thinking about. Are there any questions in our chat, Julianne, before we move on to another topic? No questions right now, but I just had a quick comment. I love the one-page introduction, too, because you're right. Those things, the IEPs are so long, um, but also... Um, I've seen in, you know, different neuropsych reports that recommend certain accommodations. There are some, and this applies mostly to um, kids who have anxiety disorders where they actually don't use their accommodations because they're too anxious to do so. Um, and so having that one page introduction that just kind of also outlines what accommodations that they do have and can use and some signs that they may be starting to get anxious, but not using their card that indicates that they need a break or things like that. Um, I just thought that was so interesting on reading reports and that one page introduction, I think would be great for that. Yeah, it's the time to let them know like, hey, my child probably won't be the one to raise their hand and let you know that they need some help or that they may fly under the radar or things like that. So that's why we want to make sure that we're reaching out, being proactive about that, because our schools and our teachers are not set up to be psychics. None of us are great psychics, but you have a lot of great information and knowledge and insight about your child as a parent that can be really helpful to their teachers as we transition into that beginning of the year. So we have more things to talk about because as we enter a new school year, it's a great time for us to help our kids with developing more independence. Absolutely. Um, again, we're looking at what is age appropriate. So really looking at what is your child capable of doing. Um, a lot of times I found in working with parents, understandably, and I'm I've been guilty of it as well, that sometimes it's easier to just do the thing for your child because they're taking too long or they're not doing it the right way or you're just frustrated and you're done micromanaging or, or nagging them. Um, and of course, we all know that the challenge is that we're not independent. That I think we move I don't know. Hard time hearing. 
Well, yes, we... I'm also having a hard time hearing, so I'm not sure. We'll give Carrie a minute to. We'll give Carrie a minute. <laughs> but I think one of the things that we wanted to convey on this as we talked about it. Oh, Carrie, are you back? We may have just had a little bit of technical difficulty. I am back. Sorry. Yeah. Hopefully. Oh, technical g glitches of the internet abound. And this helps us also for me to just give a quick reminder that as we head back to school, I would expect setbacks, right? Yes. <laughs> expecting the unexpected is part of how we can help foster our children's development of independence. I think one of the things you were just chatting about, Carrie, was, um, you know, making sure that we're thinking about what is age appropriate and when we might be doing more for our children. I think that's where, where you had left off. Yes. Yeah. Um, that when we do too much for them, they get the message that they can't do it themselves. So it's not about just throwing them into the pool and saying, go ahead and swim. It's helping them. What are the strokes? How, what are the survival modes? What are the skills and strategies you need to be able to swim? So it's providing that scaffolding and that support until they can do it more independently, but not doing it for them. Um, so balancing that support um and providing that scaffolding and and not enabling them um looks like my internet may be unstable again um but i i like your point too of just trying to move through those challenges right like i could have easily gotten really all of us could have gotten frustrated and and kind of quit this but instead we're gonna like roll with what we have and and keep going um but also respecting their pace and their process. So what I find a lot of times is for parents who like the structure, like the routine, um, and struggle when there's a mess, that having a child who is messy or struggles with the routine or has time blindness can be really frustrating. Um, and again, going back to, you know, what we talked about earlier, with you know what device or what what strategy works for you best when it comes to the routine knowing that everybody has their process and there is not one way to try to do things and so it's not about letting your kid not do anything but finding a way for them to do their task to do their chore to do the routine in a way that works for them but still fits within the needs of the family as well um so one example of that would be, you know, that if a family, um, well, let's, let's do the example that I feel like comes up a lot. All the backpacks and the shoes get dumped in the front hallway when the kids first come home and it drives, you know, a parent crazy. So if that's happening, how, what kind of scaffolding or support can you provide to help them do that more independently? And it may not look like putting the shoes in the cubby and the jacket hung up and the backpack here, which might be ideal for some. It may be, here's a basket. This is your basket. Put all your stuff in this basket next to the door when you come home. So stuff's not all over the place. And that when you are looking for your backpack, you can go to your basket and find it. This stuff might still end up on the floor next to the basket, but that's a little bit easier to kind of come back or maybe you even throw it into the basket. Um, I think there might be some questions in the chat so I can pause for a second. Um, there's one um, that kind of reverts a little bit back to what we were talking about the 504 mm -hmm. and selecting a teacher. Um, so question regarding picking the best teacher. I have thought about requesting my child's favorite teacher. My ADHD daughter likes this because they have great things to say about her, but they often don't see a lot of issues in the classroom and so don't support accommodations. Inviting the teachers she has the hardest time is tricky too. They tend to revert to she's just lazy, needs more independence and to make more effort. So they don't support accommodations either. Do you, either of you have comments on that situation? I think so when getting perspective, especially if your child has multiple teachers and you're thinking about who is best to involve to a meeting. And if you find that you, your child is experiencing the, quite the, the range of things, right. Where one teacher is saying, you know, I have just not seen any issues or concerns because perhaps their classroom is structured in such a way that your child's difficulties are not really magnified. 
you might have another teacher where your child's difficulties are really magnified because of the structure of the class or the demands of the class and your child's specific needs. I think in that in that situation, when you find that there is such a, you know, you've got a wide range, it's really helpful to actually then make sure that the team is soliciting input from both so that as a team, you can consider and say, huh, it seems like my child does really differently depending on the type of setting that they're in and what are the demands, right? Which we know that that's also very human nature, right? That many of us look like we're doing absolutely fantastic in certain environments where we may look like we're really struggling in other environments that are placing other demands on us. And that as a team developing accommodations or needed supports or strategies needs to take into account that your child's needs actually may look different in different settings. And I think that's a more nuanced part. That's kind of like what I call like next level IEPs or next level 504 plans, where we recognize that even though we may have accommodations or support plans that are written to be carried out in all environments and all settings, there may be environments or settings where those are less needed or not needed as frequently. And I think it's also very challenging as a parent, especially if you're getting feedback about that, like your child is just lazy, right? Ooh. That's one where it's very hard not to respond in an emotional way and in a defensive way, um, but in a way to say, you know, that sounds really frustrating um, that my child, you know, is appearing to tune out or disengage or, you know, not able to demonstrate all of the things that I know that they're quite capable of, but that they're really struggling in your environment. And I think turning sometimes that language around can also be really powerful so that you can model and provide um, teachers with different language that is taking into account what's going on. Unless your child's like, you know, blatantly falling asleep in the classroom, right? And those are different things. I mean, that's in a whole other behavior and that's, you know, we can talk about teens 101 all day long and what happens in first period math class. Um, But I think giving some different language around that, because that can also be really heart wrenching to hear as a parent, if you're getting that kind of feedback from teachers, but I would invite, you know, to pare down, I'd invite the range of perspectives and then also encourage the team to discuss why does this child look different in different settings? What are the demands, the environmental characteristics and the characteristics of the child that are leading them to look different in different settings so that we're creating a more nuanced IEP or plan that works for that child? Great question. Thank you so much for that. We have another question about fostering independence. Um, How do I convince a spouse who tends to like to smooth the path that our kids should be asked to do more? Um, Of course, our daughter sometimes doesn't do her job if parents get it for her. So how do you help parents kind of get on board with (laughs) where their child should be doing this task on their own versus needing parent support? I think we might have lost Carrie again, but yeah. So I'll I'll jump in for that one and tell. Oh, there we go. Hey, Carrie, did you hear that question? It was about how do we help get us? Yes, I am back. Green independence. Um, but could you, Julian? Could you maybe rephrase that? Yes. So basically, one parent likes to. Is kind it of the be- um, question that's in the chat? Yes. Um, the question about basically one spouse wanting to kind of make it a little bit easier on the child, do some more things, whereas the other parent feels like the child is at the age where they should be doing some of these things. All right. So I don't know if Carrie is still with us. Um, Dr. Reisman, do you have any thoughts on that? (laughs) No, I do think it is. This is where it's good to have the team meeting of the parents, right? Or the team meeting of the grownups that are involved in this so that you can understand and come to some agreement about that. Because I think our our kids are fantastic at picking up when the grownups in their lives have different views about what the expectations are. And our kids are experts at picking up on, oh, I know that dad is going to just do this for me. And maybe that task brings dad some joy and I'm going to let him do it. But mom is going to expect me to do that on my own. So I'm going to, you know, do that with mom. Um, When it can, you know, become frustrating is when um, there's significant disagreement about what the tasks are when that's causing more challenge in the relationship. Um, So I think it's good first to start off. It's just a frank conversation of 
sometimes when you get down to having these conversations with, you know, with your spouse or with a loved one or with a grandparent who may be helping out in the mornings, whatever the situation may be, is that we develop some strong feelings about what is appropriate for our children to be doing. So I would just one, recognize that there can be a lot of emotion tied up in that. And two, to recognize that you probably have, I get back to what are our shared goals? Our shared goal is to, you know, raise this child so that they can go out and really do whatever they'd like to in the world and to be able to, you know, do a lot of different things and to figure out, is this a, you know, a big deal or a little deal at this point in time? Um, and that, what should we be doing? And if you need help in determining what is age appropriate, I think there are some fantastic checklists and other things out there, especially if we're talking about more like adaptive skills, the day-to-day -day life skills types of things versus the classroom-based skills. Um, so that you can kind of check yourself and to say, okay, you know, is my child way off base here? And also culturally and in your family, what is culturally important and what is important to your family? Because for some families, it may be, you know, grandma really loves doing this activity for your child. And it's going to cause a lot of drama if we take that away from grandma at the moment. Um, so making sure that we're thinking about carefully about how we proceed with making some of those decisions and, and doing that jointly and having some good open communication about that. That can be more challenging, more parenting across households. Carrie, did you have other things? I was just saying about having adult discussions about some of these things to come to shared conclusions about our goals when we're parenting. And that can be challenging sometimes and emotional. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I often say when I'm talking to parents is that if each of you kind of stays on your side of the line, you're, neither of you are doing what you want. So coming to the middle, even when it's difficult, is going to help your child, right? I also like to um, kind of give tie breaking to the parent who is going to do the implementation on that specific thing. So for example, if dad wants, you know, um, certain things to happen in the morning and, and to have them do three chores before they leave for school, but he's leaving way before that happens, then mom gets that ultimate tie breaking of whether <laughs> she's gonna do that or not. Now. There's some non-negotiables, right? But in terms of, I think the really important thing is not what the rules are so much, it's whether you can implement them and do it consistently, right? I think that's huge, that's huge. And yeah. also like, I think it, to me, it gets back to the, you probably, even if you're finding yourself disagreeing, um, you know, with others about how we foster independence, that you probably have the shared goal of fostering the independence of your child. You may be disagreeing about some of the nitty gritty of stuff, but you both have, you, you, you know, whoever is involved with getting that morning routine done or the afternoon routine or other things, you do actually have a lot more in common than you think. Absolutely. And I find that once parents are able to sort of get out of their own way when it comes to the agreement that a lot are more on the same page than they realize. Um, and the other thing I would do is check in with your child. What are they feeling ready for? And is this, or, is this a kid who, you know, has, um, is more likely to engage in risky behaviors and, and, you know, might run across the street without paying attention? Well, then I would say, well, work on teaching that skill. You know, if they want to walk home from school by themselves, like, walk with them, make sure that they have the skill to pay attention to the cars coming out of the driveway and, you know, all the things that will help keep them safe when they're walking back and forth. If you have a relatively cautious child and they're asking to do something that's making you feel uncomfortable, check yourself, think about why is that making me uncomfortable? And I would err on the side of letting, you know, your more cautious child go for whatever that is calling them to be more independent. It can be really scary as a parent to allow these things to happen. And let's be real, there's a lot of judgment about other people's parenting. So sometimes what holds us back is being judged by other parents for our parenting decisions. But I would say at the end of the day, the most important thing is tuning into your family, your child, and really looking at what is gonna work for your child specifically and your family. And it doesn't have to look like anybody else's. 
what we should probably have one more just topic. I'm curious, Carrie's thoughts on this, but I want to just also mention it is that as parents, we don't realize until we kind of hit some of these things, but there's certain times developmentally when windows open and windows close for different skills, right? And that for those parenting at this younger age set, this fostering independence, it feels like, what do you mean fostering independence? My child is just like taking all of the independence that they need and then they want. And then sometimes, you know, parents of middle and high school that I talk to, parents are just in my office going, I really want my child to be more independent, but where is this, you know, feisty five-year-old that I had who was trying to do everything themselves and now they're totally okay with mom doing this? Wait, what? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think one other thing that Carrie and I have, you know, chatted about is that there's sometimes these like developmental windows that we have and to recognize when you're right at one, when your child is like chomping at the bit for the walking home from school, you know, from the more independence and to recognize you might be at that stage where you've got an open window and that in a couple of years, you might be like trying to wedge open that next window. And sometimes we don't realize we're in them until we've gotten a little bit past them. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. All right. So we've got some more topics to talk about before we have Q&A, unless there was anything else you wanted me to uh, us to hit on, Julianne, before I went on to our next topic. So there is one more question. And Chris, I hope that you can hang on until the Q&A just because it goes back to the 504 plan. And I know we have a few things to just get through. So I'm going to hope that Chris can hang on. Okay. Sounds good. Um, but I think expectations is a nice topic to kind of piggyback off of when it comes down to fostering independence. And particularly for our parents who may be on this call that are facing parenting jumps and expectations, right? Say your child just went from elementary to school to middle school or from a middle school program to a high school program. Those are some of our times, or even when we're thinking about, you know, third grade to fourth grade is a jump in many school systems, is that we have jumps and expectations externally that can be challenging for many children, especially if we haven't done a good job of providing scaffolding for them. And when we think about scaffolding, it's that stuff that we need to help us climb up that ladder. And for me, one of the things and as a neuropsychologist I think about is making sure that we have robust safety nets so that we can also help give our children the freedom to increase that independence, increase that autonomy, but have a safety net check. Um, so that in other words, we can be encouraging them to perhaps experience some natural consequences of their actions, or especially if we're, you know, looking to them to improve in their organization or their time management skills, their time estimation skills to increase that, but also provide a safety net so that there is a check of like, Hey buddy, it is now 8 PM. I know your goal was to get done with these three things by 8 PM. Let's check in on that. How are we doing as opposed to, okay, it's now it's time to get ready for bed. What do you mean you didn't get that done? And then we've got a conflict brewing, which is just no fun and nobody wants to have it nine o'clock at night. Um, I think also I will just say this. So, you know, our practice here in Bethesda, Maryland, where both Carrie and I are located, we have lovely examples of age inappropriate expectations spotted in the wild. And so as a parent, you've probably come across or encountered these in the wild and you may not have even known it, right? And so I just wanted us to generate a few examples and share them with you because oftentimes when I come across this, I just say, well, that's, you know, as a neuropsychologist, when I think about you know, normative development of what do I expect a brain to be able to do at eight years old and at 10 years old and at 12 years old. So some age inappropriate expectations that I can spot in the wild would be around, um, you know, when I think about eight year olds managing homework time after school, mm -hmm. pretty age inappropriate expectation. I will just put that out there. And I think especially when we have an environment that might have above average expectations, there are certainly some eight-year-olds that are able to do that. But many of our eight-year-olds are struggling with things like time estimation. And it is good for us to be thinking about teaching about time and teaching about those skills so that they develop them as they hit 12 years old that they are able to better plan out what can I do with a 30 minute chunk of time? What can I do with an hour chunk of time? Um, but that planning in advance, right? When we think about eight-year-old brains, nine-year-old brains, 10-year-old brains, even typically developing brains, that it is a pretty age inappropriate expectation for them to be planning, you know, a multi-step project that is going to culminate in something and accurately estimating time. That's mm -hmm. one age inappropriate expectation that I've seen. I just want to um, quickly interject because this yeah. Right, directly into this. Um, are the developmental windows for increasing responsibility different for ADHD kids versus neurotypical? Um, and then how do you know when they 
are open for an ADHD or so you gave some numbers yeah. you gave eight and 12 so you know Oh yeah. So eight and 12, I'm just using as some examples here, but I will say also developmental windows for um, autonomy, very, very individualized. We definitely know though, like as general rules for children with ADHD and children that don't have ADHD, um, you know, between three to six is a huge window, right? It's like a wide open window for increasing independence. Um, kids want to do for themselves, by themselves, dressing, eating, the challenging part is that they are still mastering some of those skills, so they may not be as efficient as we are, right? And I think that's one of the things that Carrie does a lovely job talking about in terms of like when when there's this, you know, kind of bumping up against expectations, what I need to get done, that can be really challenging. Um, and so realizing, yeah, there may be some times when you just need to jump on in and help your child get out the door, but that otherwise we're in the middle of a wide open window for, you know, independence with probably even like, you know, Many of our six-year-olds want to learn mm -hmm. how to cook. Many of our teenagers are on the other hand, like, yeah, no, <laughs> you know, even though that can also be something that can be motivating if we're doing that. There's a lot of like social cultural things where they, you know, there's a lot of writers and people that have researched about how certain things and expectations in our culture have actually reduced some opportunities for independence. So I think as parents and as people working with families and children, we're very conscious of that, especially as we think about children with ADHD, where they may unfortunately have less opportunities than typically developing children sometimes to have some of the that practice to develop independence and autonomy, and it may be less reinforced. So I know, care, you know, we're very conscious of that in our work to make sure that we're giving children as many of those opportunities as they can that are, you know, typically developing. When I think about some other um, things that we encounter in terms of sweet spots for, you know, open windows for appropriate expectations and things like that, um, is that jump in high school when we think about both like self-advocacy, self-knowledge, things that go along with high schoolers trying on different identities, figuring out who they are is a really fantastic time for helping our high schoolers transition to becoming more of an appropriate self-advocate. At the middle school level, it can be hit or miss. Mm -hmm. um, right. Some of our middle schoolers are very, you know, great with taking on a little bit more self-advocacy roles within their IEPs. Some just are not ready. And then I think another part is the emotional state of your child. Is your child one? And I know we've got this coming up in a topic, you know, that tends a little bit more towards anxiety and how can that play into it and as well, but that your child and their, you know, windows and what they're ready for may look different from another child's and that's okay. Um, but some of our age and appropriate expectations that I see are also things like neat reading logs, right? And things like that. <laughs> There's many things that we know that don't necessarily correlate with the task, but we just have to get through and get done, but may not become automatic routines. I think mm -hmm. that's another one when we think about expecting a child to internalize a school-based routine and whether or not that's an age appropriate or age inappropriate expectation that it may take your child more reps than another child. But if they're still working on it and they still need an explicit cue or reminder, that's okay. As long as we're working towards that goal and not taking away um, a, a age appropriate support for them. And I also think this is where reeling in our need for comparison is very helpful. Um, because just because one child can do it in the classroom or in the family doesn't mean that all children are going to be capable of doing that. And it also doesn't mean that, you know, your child isn't ready simply because you haven't seen anybody in your family at that age doing that. You know, if your child has a special skill or talent, many of our children have very unique special interests that we want to kind of encourage and point them in that direction. And they may show more independence, autonomy, and be able to excel in that area compared to others. But I think about expectations. I also think about that many times when I'm talking with family about what are the pain points in their day, it's usually when the expectation and the environmental demands and the child's skills are just significantly misaligned. And when those are misaligned, that's when you're more likely to have the child getting upset, the child avoiding that task or telling you that the teacher is, you know, something's not going right in that class. So it's really good to, you know, examine does the child not have the skill set needed to be successful in some of these things? Is, do we need to revamp and realign whether or not our expectations are completely off and perhaps go back to that IEP 504 plan team to figure out if we have a real misalignment as we, as we, as we've jumped into a new environment, perhaps. Absolutely. And I think 
kind of piggybacking on that is that there's also these ADHD factors that are playing a role that a kid can get overwhelmed by a task that you need to think, oh, just go clean your room. Well, for an ADHD brain, you walk into a messy room and it's like, where do I start? What do I do? This is overwhelming. I'm going to walk out of the room and go do something else. Or I'm going to go pick, or I'm going to start this process and I'm going through and I see something that's interesting and now I'm going to go read this book for the next hour, right? So there's other factors playing into this as well. I motivation's another one. So, you know, when you're talking about this jump to from middle school to high school, you know, where kids um, kind of have that window is, as you said, Jen, very individualized, right? So um, for a kid who might have a goal of college, you know, and want to go to a certain one, they may be more invested in their grades. Um you know, some kids just may be rule followers. And so therefore they want to make sure they get their homework done. One of the keys to independence is also like you were talking about, Jen, is giving that space. If, if we care more about the outcomes than our kids do, we zap that motivation and it's gone, right? Because we've just taken that on for them. Then but we're if, cringe. Then we're cringe. Yes. 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 Exactly. And so we really want them to feel some ownership and to want it. But if we want it more than them, I can almost guarantee that's not going to happen. So really checking ourselves as to like, how much do we get involved? How much do we step back? And I wish I could tell you an exact formula for that. Um, but I think it's paying attention to your kid, um, recognizing what they want and what they're motivated and follow that motivation. Um, so for some kids that might be, they really do want to get to school on time and therefore that routine in the morning is going to go smoother. Another kid, um, you know, may want to get all their homework done. So they have more free time after school. So they do it at school. And then there's other kids that need to find their motivation somewhere outside of school. Um, but uh, there's so many factors and I think absolutely it's very individualized and it's about really tuning into your kid. I'm going to move us ahead because we have a few more topics we want to talk about. And I love talking about back to school anxiety, but I'm going to let Carrie talk a little bit about this as well. Cause I know that I just feel like the anxiety level of all of our families has ramped up with back to school. Yes. And I think anxiety in general has, is, hits a heightened um, point, you know, um, but back to school anxiety doesn't just happen before the first day. Um, it can happen in the first month. Um, it could be about a teacher um, managing the expectations, but any sort of unknown new thing transition, as you know, can trigger anxiety, right? Um, so how do you manage it? Again, we're talking going a lot of the theme today has been the scaffolding and skill development, right? So um, really it's about helping support your child. What are their coping mechanisms? You want to validate their concern, even if you don't agree with it. When we say things like you're going to be fine, we've completely dismissed that feeling of anxiety and guess what happens to it? It goes up through the roof. But if we validate it, like I understand you're feeling you know, worried about the first day of school. Um, let's talk about it. You know, maybe there's a person that they can go to. Um, I think having people to go to in the school and make those connections can help a lot. What are their coping skills? What can they do? You know, and it seems silly, but that whole idea of faking it till you make it, there's a lot of power in some of the self-talk. You know, sometimes you need to engage that prefrontal cortex to tell the emotional part of our brain, the amygdala, we're okay. This is scary, but we're going to be okay. Um, so giving them like a line or something to say, and of course, depending on the age, they may think you're cringy, but again, if you involve them in this process, what helps you feel calmer? You know, is there a friend that you can walk into school with? Like, what can you do to sort of scaffold and support that transition into the school year? And I love that you also talked about 
managing our own anxiety first, because I think sometimes as parents, we don't realize how much anxiety we may have been holding on to, especially depending on whatever our own experiences were as we went through school and went to school and how that might be impacting the lens in which we're seeing our child's experience with, right? Absolutely. And, you know, even if you don't struggle with your own anxiety, we all have some level of anxiety, but even if that's not a big issue, if your child is stressed and anxious, that in and of itself can make you stressed. But guess what? Our stress can also bleed in over into our child as well. And they're going to pick up on it. But not only will they pick up on that, and it's going to be hard to convey confidence in, in that they can do this, even though they're scared. Being brave is not about not being scared. It's about doing something, even though you're scared, right? But the other problem is, is that when we're anxious, we're not at our calm emotional state, we make less effective decisions. And so we may say something or we may convey something or we may even encourage them to avoid things that they're worried about. That could be a whole nother webinar probably. Um, but absolutely managing our own anxiety, helping them identify their coping skills, providing some scaffolding for them, and then encouraging them. And maybe you need to fake it till you make it and just say, to be okay. They're going to be okay. Um, and manage that anxiety through the process so that they feel some confidence, you know, again, sort of like we talked about before, if they don't think you're confident or, or that they, they believe that you don't think they can do it, it's, they're going to feel that. Right. So I am also hearing you say an unwritten rule that we should be as parents taking really good care of ourselves during this time, because that's a high, that's a high demand as a parent, right? Managing own anxiety, helping our children to manage any anxiety that they may be feeling as they've headed back to school and to be able to respond in that effective way and not respond in the impulsive way that when we know, right, as a parent, we almost know the minute those words have left our mouth of like, oh, I wish I hadn't said that in response to what my child just brought and shared with me, but that it's a yeah. lot harder to do when we're stressed, when we haven't eaten because we were busy packing everybody else's lunches and didn't bother to pack anything for ourselves, right? That's hard. Yes. Yes. And I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the big self-care, go to the spa, get a facial, you know, it could be five minutes of taking deep breaths in, in the car or listening to your favorite song or, you know, stopping and smelling the roses, whatever works for you that doesn't take a lot of time and that you do it frequently. Like don't wait till you're feeling stressed. Try to incorporate that throughout the day, whether you're feeling stressed or not, take those deep breaths, walk away, take a break. You know, whether you have ADHD or anxiety or not, it helps all of us. And there's so much research to back that up. Much. All right. I know we are heading towards the end of some of our time together. So we also wanted to have, make sure that we gave some good time for any of our questions that may be in the chat or topics that we didn't perhaps cover that people have questions about as we head back to school. But I just also want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I really enjoyed talking about all things back to school. It's been something as a center. And so thank you, Julianne, for putting this together as well for us. Yeah, yeah. it's been lovely. Thank you both. And we do have a few questions that um, came up. And so you've touched on it a little bit, but I will see if you have any other thoughts. Can you share expectations, realistic expectations for mid-teens? So 14 and 15. Mm. Oh, good. So realistic expectations for 14 and 15. Um, I think when we think about that, that's also like transitioning to high school types of things. I think that one Carrie talked about, and I like just talking about is that check-in where you also make sure that your child's buy-in and priorities are there, right? Mm -hmm. Because you may find that this is where your child's going to express some more of like, you know, I'm signed up for these things, but here's the ones that are most important to me and making decisions based on what is most important to them. So making sure that they have some buy-in on that. Um, I think this is where the managing a scheduling, managing a schedule and helping to develop those multi-step planning techniques is a sweet spot. And this is a sweet spot where your child is probably ready, primed for this. They're thinking more long-term. They're trying out some big ideas. They may change every couple of weeks, you know, with our 14 and 15 year olds and that's okay, but they're thinking big and mm -hmm. so using some of that big thinking to help say, okay, well, your goal of X 
let's back chain it. What are some of the really important things that we have to do in high school or tonight or with your sports teams or whatever it is that you're involved with to help, you know, build a plan towards that. I think it's also where, you know, 14 and 15 is also starting to recognize our membership in a community and a household. And what is our role within that in an age appropriate age expectation way, as opposed to like, I just told you to do this. So, you know, go do that. But like what needs to get done in our household and what are you really good at? Is it being more helpful with mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, preparing dinner once a week? You know, if you're going to be complaining that you don't like what I'm cooking for dinner, do you want to, you know, take over dinner on Wednesday night and it'll be, you know, your night. And I, I think that there are some very age appropriate things um, and starting to take responsibility for self and others when we start to think about our 14 and 15 year olds are really primed for not just themselves, but for looking outside themselves and how they fit as members of a community and what roles they play. So I think tuning into some of those sweet spots can help us with expectations for our 14 and 15 year olds for our new high schoolers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that comes up, it seems like a silly thing, but it comes up all the time, that planning, not just in terms of academics, mm -hmm which one side note with academics is making sure that they're also not just doing what their friends are doing and that they find some classes that they enjoy if they have some choice, right? Um, but in terms of planning and their social life is oftentimes, I think particularly 14 and 15 year old boys, but also can be girls, that there is a lack of planning. So it's like, I'm just going here, this is what I'm doing, or can I do this, right? So I have this rule in my household, which, you know, um, and I've shared it with some other parents. I just shared it with a, a family earlier when they were uh, expressing concerns about this. Do not come to me until you have answers to the questions of when is it, who is going, how much does it cost, and what is the plan around getting there and getting home? <laughs> so, and that could be used for a lot of different situations, but having them think through a plan and then that be part of the discussion before you say yes to something. But it's really that planning piece. And this is where we can sort of be the gatekeepers and say, this cannot go forward unless you engage these skills, right? Um, I don't know if that's, been an experience for you at all, Jen, but that planning and, you know, just sort of thinking everything's going to work out, right? Like, well, I want to do this. I'm just going to do it. Who's driving? I don't know. <laughs> right. And giving them a recipe or a formula for these are the things that I expect to have answered, like, so that it's not a uh, mom, I don't know what you expect me to do. Like, you know, I'm not psychic, but to give them like a recipe or a formula, like, Hey, before you ask me about these things, these are the three things I need to know, or the four things, whatever it is, um, to let them know that this is, you know, very expected. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, Chris, I'm sorry, I'm back to you. So um, she said, after my child received an assessment and medical diagnosis for inattentive ADHD, she requested a 504 plan for him at school, but it was ultimately denied. And it was an awful invalidating experience, I'm sure, um, including for myself as a late diagnosed ADHD. -er. Do you have suggestions for how to address this in the new school year? The reasons were very problematic. The school disability coordinator couldn't see that he was struggling. Yeah. So I will say one thing that I, you know, I'm a big one. I just want to apologize. Our system is not set up perfectly and our system is really unfortunately set up for children who are struggling in the way that school systems like to see them struggle. Right. And when I say school systems like to see them struggle, I mean, very obvious things. So when our children are struggling in ways that aren't impacting things like their grades or their academic performance, we can often run into schools that say, well, your child's doing fine. Right. But what they're not seeing is they're not peeling back the layer and they're not seeing how hard is my child having to work to do this? How much time is homework taking at night? Or how much support am I having to provide it as a parent or that be in age inappropriate? Um, you know, where there's a lot of support being provided behind the scenes that the school just isn't seeing, because as a parent, you're probably not going to allow your child to fail. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing is, is the appeals process, right? So even though an initial decision may have been made that your child did not qualify for that, that is one that can be appealed, right? Is it frustrating? Is it awful? And do I have, have I had some families say, you know what, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to do that. And, you know, I, I think that that's a very individualized and personalized decision. 
I think there's also um, two things I would do. One is I recommend families in that situation to involve other people and to bring somebody else with them to a meeting if that is an, a decision that's appealed to express that in writing. And three, to contact usually people within a school system central office that may be more knowledgeable about that to determine if there was anything procedurally that was you know, a hiccup, right? If something procedurally didn't follow the rules and needs revisiting, let's revisit that. Um, or two, if there was something that was done inappropriately. And sometimes just having somebody else review the process that was done can be really helpful because I can tell you mistakes happen all the time, right? I can have perfect documentation. A family can have perfect documentation and things go wrong and making sure that we go through that review or appeals process and involve sometimes a third party from like a central office of the school system um, to look into that. And I also would say that organizations like CHAD and Project HEAL, um, and depending on your state, if you're in Maryland, like Disability Rights Maryland, other places also have form letters, templates for requesting a review of that um, process. And so I can see you're in DC, we can definitely follow up um, with some resources that are more DC specific, because there are just, you know, jurisdictional disability rights resources that we want to make sure all of our families are aware of so that they know that they're not navigating this all alone. Mm -hmm. really frustrating. And I, I can also say you're not alone in that. And so thank you for asking and sharing that question because I know others probably have that as well. Thank you. Um, another question. So talking about real estate expectations for after school obligations, this is for an 11 year old who does not want to do daily reading between four and five 30, um, but we'll get it done between six 30 and seven 30, but it's just not interested in doing it earlier, even with small bribes. This is 10 pages of reading in a chapter book. Should we just be happy it's getting done, even though it would be faster or she would have better recall if she did it before the stimulants wear off? Mm -hmm. Good question. I'm curious your thoughts, Carrie, is if the time one is. Usually I would say go with what they're doing. If they're doing it, do it as long as it's not negatively impacting something else. So if it's delaying bedtime, if it is causing a meltdown, if it's, you know, if they aren't retaining the information because they're not on the stimulants, if it takes a little longer, I think that's okay. Again, we're looking at the motivation and that sense of independence. Um, so, you know, if there were no other factors, I would say go with it. Um, but I guess it depends on if there's another negative impact. I also, just before we continue answering this, I know that we are ending at 1.45, but we're kind of going to stay on and just answer one more question, but this will be recorded and sent to everybody. So if you have to hop off, um, I just wanted to say that. But Dr. Eastman, do you have any thoughts on that? I am going to just completely echo what Carrie said. I think the most important thing is if it gets done and also that our 11 and 12 year olds sometimes really just want to have a choice <laughs> and that if it's that's where, you know, I would ask myself, is that the hill I want to die on? But I completely agree that as a parent perspective, you are completely thinking about the right things of like, oh, you know, I know you're on stimulant medication and I know that you're probably more focused and able to get this done more quickly earlier in the day. You are totally right. Your child is just feeling that need for some autonomy there. And if they're getting it done, I would let that one go. Yeah. Okay, and one last question. So talking about a 10 year old um, who is finding it difficult to remember things taught in school. Do you have any insight on how they can help their son with that? Oh, is this right. the also where when we come home and it's like, what happened in school? And then we find out that they say, you know, absolutely nothing. I would say this is also where we need to make sure to communicate back with the school and find out what indeed was going on to help help our children with recall because many of our kids will do better with like a recognition types of things. Oh, I heard you did about this. Was it this or was it like that? Then like the free recall, putting them on the spot. What did you learn about in history today? Things like that. Carrie, other thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point is, is the perception that they don't remember or is it just that they're focused on what's going on now, right? Like they live much more in the moment than we do. And I think there is a lot that they could teach us at times with that. Um, but a lot of times they're, they've moved on from what happened at school. And, um, you know, I think asking questions in general, like what was the high of the day and what was the low of the day, then rather than targeted questions allows them to really talk about what's on their mind. Um, but yeah, oftentimes they just, they may or may not remember, but they may just want to be focused on whatever's in front of them at that moment. 
The only other thing that Carrie's making me think about is that we do have some children who have struggled more with the transition to many of classroom materials and depending on the type of classroom setting your child's in, if many of the things are online, as opposed to right when children had a lot more paper materials and you could look at the backpack and you could look and see what was in the backpack and use that. So that can be a point to make a request of, hey, you know, school, if my child has access to a handout, can you share that with me or let me know where I can find that so that I can help prompt and revisit with my child for the child who may have been attentive during that classroom part of the presentation or not. Um, but that as a parent, it's really, you're kind of operating in the dark if you can't see either what a handout was or what kind of the material was going over. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Awesome. I'm well, if, oh, <laughs> um, if you all don't have any other thoughts, we just appreciate Dr. Reisman and Carrie so much for talking with us about this. I learned so much um, and we will be sharing this. Um, this is part of our Ask the Expert series at the Chesapeake Center. So if you have questions about the Chesapeake Center as well, you're welcome to email me. My email is info at chesapeakeadd.com. Um, you can also fill out the contact form on our website, which is www.thechesapeakecenter.com. Um, but stay tuned for future Ask the Expert and just join me in thanking Dr. Reisman and Carrie for their time today. Um, and we hope you all have a wonderful, if you haven't already started the school year, start to the school year, but um, we are thinking of you all and wishing you well during this time. So thank you. Julianne, thank you everybody.